God's grace and peace to you today. I hope you're doing well and that you're cool and comfortable because I'm coming to you from the surface of the sun. It's about 98, 100 or so degrees, but with the heat index, it's only about 138. So uh, 138, 100, 140 somewhere. <laughs> it's so hot here. Uh, but it's a cool 71 degrees here in this room, so I can't complain. And before we get started, since it is so hot and I want you to be comfortable, I hope you have your refreshing, artificially laced, uh, chemically laced, that is, artificially sweetened beverage. Like, uh, you know, my favorite now is this, the Monster, the Ultra Fiesta. It's grapefruit flavored. I know. Don't worry, you don't have to tell me. I know this is a can of chemicals. That's why I like it. They are happy tasting chemicals. Uh, my favorite beverage is Diet Sunkist Orange, but I'm going to go with this since it's Texas. We're going to go with this today. Look, Diet Dr. Pepper. <laughs> I like the Diet Cherry Dr. Pepper. Here it is. Here it is. Oh, the sound of refreshment. But uh, since they didn't have Diet Cherry Dr. Pepper, then we can just do this, all right? I'm just going to sip it and filter it through the delicious cherries. One more thing <laughs> I have on this uh, hideous palm tree shirt just for you, Sister Anna. Anna Floyd knows my loathing for palm trees, that I think they're the spawn of, they're the spawn of Satan. Uh, and so she's gotten me some palm tree gifts here and there, which are really nice, and I appreciate that. And so I got this shirt just to make her and, and others happy. All right, we're going to jump into Christology, Lucan Christology. At last, we find ourselves in the final section for the book of Luke, and we'll have a summary, and then we're going to move on. And I'm actually going to do, Lord willing, Mark next, but... We've already covered the themes and theology, and I've got my timer. Wait, I've got it. Uh, I'm just starting it a couple minutes late here. but So we finished the themes and theology. Let's move on to the Christology of Luke's Gospel, which we need to consider the book of Acts in that as well, as you know. So Luke's writings, so we say Luke and Christology. Now I realize there's going to be repetition here because we've been hinting at and touching on the Christology of Luke's writings all along here, but now we're sort of bringing them together. What is Luke's gospel and Luke part two? What is God telling us about Jesus Christ? What distinctive image emerges of our Lord and our Savior Jesus from reading Luke's writings? All right, let's think about that for a minute. And bear in mind as we do this that we're going to be seeing a variety of, of concepts because Luke, Luke, uses a diversity of concepts. He gives us a, a diversity of images of Jesus. And that fits with the idea of Luke writing, make sure my microphone is up, uh, Luke writing to the Gentiles and to a wider audience because as we've seen, he embeds his gospel in all of human history, in the biblical story and in the entirety of the world's history. And so we know he's appealing to a wide variety of people. And so it makes sense that he's going to present Christ in a number of different images. And there's some overlapping in these. And there's some distinctions that can be made as well. And so I want us to think about them in the following categories. Now, there are different ways that you could group these together or you could just list them all separately and make whatever observations you would for each one. But I'm trying to do them under these categories because I think it will be helpful for us to make sense of the depiction of Christ that emerges when we look carefully at all that Luke is telling us about our Lord Jesus. So let's look at these categories. Let's think about what they might be. And again, uh, this is just the way I've decided to categorize them, and you might think of other ways. Whoops, whoops. So let me, let me take that 
out of view here, these categories for thinking about Christ. I'm going to look at just a general area that would be a good summary way to think about what Luke tells us about Jesus and then look at some Hebrew categories that emerge from Luke's gospels, uh, gospel and his uh, writing in Acts. And then we see also some Greek and Greco-Roman ideas about Jesus that we, I think there are some there. We're not going to spend as much time on that. We're not going to get to that in this class. But we will tack on a few things about that, and then we'll be able to have the summary of Luke's gospel next time, Lord willing. So uh, first of all, let's categorize what we're about to look at under this general heading, where these might sort of capture all that we're seeing about Jesus, or we could just think of them as a good summary depiction of Jesus. And one of them is that Jesus, of course, is Savior, that Luke uniquely emphasizes Jesus as Savior. Of course, as we keep saying all along with so many of these things, all of the Gospels present Jesus in some way, to some degree, as the Savior. But it's in Luke's Gospel we find, and in the book of Acts, Jesus is explicitly identified as the Savior, and there's a special emphasis on that. The Greek word soter for Savior. He's the Savior of all men. Notice I've got a, I've got a little footnote here because I guess it's considered sexist now to use the gender uh, to refer to, use the gender as, what's the term I want? Generic for all people. So I've got a little note here. Let's see if I can zoom in on it there. Uh, by, uh, my little footnote is by men, of course, we, we mean all people, both men and women. But because Whoops, because that's considered sexist, the way we would say it now is Jesus is the Savior of all people. Okay, uh, and really that has become standard. And so in a lot of translations where you have the Greek word anthropos or anthropoi, the plural men, like Jesus is, uh, or God commands all men everywhere to repent. For example, Acts 17 and verse 30 like the ESV and other Bibles will say, um, well, not in that case, but often in the ESV, uh, the text will say God commands all people everywhere to repent. Now, in that one, for some reason, I want to double check myself on that. Um, they stayed with the word men. No, they do have people. So God commands all people. Well, it's the Greek word men, but they know it's being used to refer to all people, men and women, and so they, they simply use the people. I think that's sort of a capitulation toward the, because of the influence of radical feminism on our culture, but that's becoming standard, and so eventually we'll use that without even thinking about that. All right, so, but I had to get it in, see? I had to mention how it irks me. I feel better now. I hope you do, <laughs> too. So when we looked at the theme under the themes and theology of Luke's gospel, and we talked about one prominent theme being salvation, and we talked about Jesus as Savior, there we pointed out that uh, only Luke's gospel, only Luke's gospel refers to Jesus as Savior, and I, it, you find it of course, in Luke 2.11, where the angels say, There is born unto you this day in the city of David a Savior, Christ the Lord. But in the Benedictus, and then in Acts, in fact, I have these passages here just to glance at quickly. We're not going to look at too many passages here, uh, but here I have a few. Notice the angel said, Behold, verse 10, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all the people. Notice that, for all the people. For is born unto you this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior in the Benedictus, uh, Zacharias said in his prophecy that God has visited. Now that word's important too. We're going to come back to that. He's visited his people, verse 60 up, 68, and he's raised up a horn of salvation. So he refers to Christ as the horn of salvation, another way of saying that he's Savior. Then in the book of Acts, he's explicitly affirmed as the Savior where Paul says, rather Peter says to the Jewish leaders in Acts chapter 5 that God, verse 31, God exalted him to the right hand as leader and Savior to give repentance. There's another Luke and theme and how repentance is linked to the forgiveness of sins. It's so great to see all this coming together now, isn't it? Yes, I know you feel that way. 
And then later when Paul's in Antioch of Pisidia, he says about David, of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior. And then Paul shows, well, it, Paul shows that Savior is for all the world. And he did it as he promised. Notice repentance again to all the people of Israel. Oh, so much that we can see now coming together from all that we've been looking at, right? So uh, notice that, and it's the only gospel, of course, and where Jesus explicitly says that he came to, not, not just to save, he came to seek and to save the lost. And in the parables that are unique to Luke, the L material that is emphasized Beautifully, there's one of my words that I like to use a lot now. But notice that that's in the case of Zacchaeus, in the household of Zacchaeus, at the end of that long, dramatic uh, journey, travel narrative. All right, so this idea of Jesus as Savior, but we said he's the Savior of all people. That's, I think, the way we need to say it. And we covered this under, when we talked about salvation, under, as one of the themes of Luke's writings, we said uh, Luke emphasizes over and over the Gentiles. Remember writing to a Gentile audience? He's writing to Theophilus. And of course, he's writing to all Jew and Gentile, we said, who are familiar with the scriptures. But we can see how his, his writing broadens to really emphasize the inclusion of the Gentiles. So we talked about that back then. And so when we think of Luke's gospel to say, well, what is Luke, how is God showing us his son in Luke? Well, he's showing us this, he, that Jesus is the savior of all people. And as I said, and Strauss uh, holds this, and I think this is a good way to say it, that you can consider that basically a good, a good summary description for the many, for the many faceted depiction of Jesus in Luke Acts, all right? Jesus, the Savior of all men. Now, Jesus as Lord, kurios, kurios. Jesus as Lord of all. Wait a minute, I'm not sure what that is. What is this over here? Let's, let's get rid of that. Cut. Let's go back and start over. No, I'm not going to go back and start over. He's Lord of all. And then once again, we know the other Gospels refer to Jesus as Lord. But this is a favorite one. Why, you know, Luke uses all the titles for Jesus that are found in the other Gospels. So we find them in Luke as well. But this is one of his favorite. He uses it more than it is in the other Gospels. But what's especially significant is Luke... Ah, see, I've got... There's something that is a glitch that is making that text appear on every page. Oh boy, I hope that isn't part of the save file. He, uh, Luke uses it himself in third person narrative. In other words, he doesn't just use it like you find in the other Gospels where, where, uh, where people in the story are calling Jesus Lord, but Luke himself will say, and the Lord said, or and the Lord answered. So Luke, the narrator, is referring to Jesus as Lord. That's quite significant. And Luke's gospel is the only one where Jesus is called Master, Master, Epistates. And I know this is probably bothering Rose. We need to fix this here because Rose, look, look, I forgot our opening accent mark here over the epsilon. Whoops, and we need to make it match with black there. Ah, there, see, we fixed that. You see where, where we had to fix that right there? Yes, we've got that little mark now, and so let's see if it'll reset. Yes! Oh, that makes me so happy the way that works. Okay, so in several texts, in fact, we can say there are seven times if you, encounter, if you count the double address in Luke 8, 24, during the storm on the sea where Jesus stills the tempest, and they wake him up, and it's in Luke's account where they say, Master! Master! And so it's interesting then that uh, when we count that, even though it's a single address, the word is used twice, that you find that term master being used seven times. That's quite symbolic then, isn't it? And it's used basically as a synonym of Lord. So Jesus, uh, Jesus as Lord, uh, he's presented as Lord 
especially in Luke. That's what I'm trying to say here. And I want to make sure we don't pass by uh, anything. All right, yes, we caught what we needed to there. So going back now to our categories, let's think of, let's spend a few minutes to think of these Hebrew categories in which Luke depicts Jesus. These um, Hebrew categories. That is, in Hebrew thought, uh, forgive me, I'm playing around with uh, some of this text here just to emphasize uh, a couple things. This, think of the way the Jews would uh, describe the, the coming Messiah. Well, the, in fact, these are Jewish concepts, and there again, there's some kind of, some kind of glitch where uh, something from another slide keeps appearing throughout. Messiah. These are ways in which, uh, these are ways, let me, I'm trying to word this correctly. This is the way the Jewish mind, these would appeal to the Jewish mind. These would be understood in the Jewish context, let's say it that way, as opposed to then later when we think of him presented in, in Greco-Roman terms, like in, as a philosopher and teacher and things like that. But in, in the Jewish mind, of course, they were, they were anticipating the coming of their Mashiach or Messiah, and that's the Greek word Christos that's translated Christ in our Bibles. Jesus, Messiah. Jesus, Christ. In fact, it, it becomes essentially so attached to Jesus as a title that it, it sounds as though it's part of his name. What is his name? Jesus Christ. It's really a title, Jesus the Christ, or Jesus is Christ, but it, it's so understood as a part of his identity that uh, it becomes said like a name, Jesus Christ. So this idea of Messiah in Luke, Luke is careful to present Jesus as the suffering Messiah. Of course, Jesus says in all the Gospels that it was necessary for him to suffer, for the Son of Man to suffer, but not in the way that it's said in Luke's Gospel. And in fact, he brings this out in such a way that I'm going to make this a whole other category. I was going to make this kind of a subheading under Luke's presentation of Jesus as Messiah. But really, I think we do well to just list it here with Messiah as a whole separate category uh, following Messiah, but closely related to it. That even though all the Gospels refer to Jesus as Messiah in Peter's great confession, that's the climatic, climactic point essentially in the synoptic Gospels that you find in each of the, of the synoptics. It's Luke, though, who most explicitly, that's what we want to say, most explicitly, because it's implied in Matthew and in Mark, but it's most explicit in Luke's writings that he is, ah, there's that, yeah, there's something wrong with the file there. And I don't even know if you were seeing what I was seeing, but uh, he identifies Jesus specifically in terms of the suffering servant. So, so the people of Israel knew that Isaiah, one of their chief prophets, spoke of the servant of the Lord in the servant songs that you have in around Isaiah 40 all the way through 53 and, and around that part of Isaiah. You find, for example, in Isaiah 42, in chapter 49, and in chapter 50, in chapter 52, 13, the very last verse of chapter 52, and then all the way through that famous chapter, Isaiah 53, that messianic, we often call that, that uh, messianic uh, prophecy where it talks about in, in detail and affirms quite explicitly the terrible suffering of the servant of the Lord. And so th there was this understanding that you have the servant of the Lord, and it wasn't always thought to be one and the same. In fact, it was not, this concept was not necessarily in the minds of the Jews of Jesus' day, was not necessarily thought to be the Messiah. They knew their scripture said, a suffering servant is going to come. Well, Luke says that suffering servant talked about by Isaiah is the Messiah, is Jesus the, the Christ. All right. Now, if that is implied, yes, 
we are getting that up there, so let me do. That. Let me make sure to do that with each slide. How am I going to do that? Uh, I'm not sure why we're having that issue. It's really uh, quite frustrating. Ah, there. It's implied in Mark's Passion account. And Matthew, now, here's where we want to be careful. Matthew does cite, he does cite Isaiah 53, 4 in chapter 8, verse 17 in connection with Jesus' miracles. He cites Isaiah 42. Uh, in chapter 12, that text where he says, uh, when he talks about him coming to the Gentiles, again, in connection with the miracles he was performing and that a uh, uh, smoking uh, a smoking wick he, sh he will not put out, and a bruised reed he will not break. That beautiful imagery. Matthew does cite Isaiah, but he does so with reference to Jesus' miracles in his ministry, not specifically to his death, whereas in Luke, this association with Jesus' death is made quite explicit because it's in Luke and only in Luke that Jesus himself quotes Isaiah 53, 12, where Jesus said that it was necessary that he, that the scripture be fulfilled, that he would be numbered among the transgressors. So he identifies himself with that suffering servant spoken of by Isaiah, who would carry our sins, who would bear our griefs, carry our sorrows, and that he would, uh, the Lord would uh, lay upon him the iniquity of us all. And in Acts chapter 8, then in Luke part 2, the eunuch is reading from Isaiah 53 when uh, Philip, sorry, it took me a moment, Philip takes him from that gospel and preaches Jesus to him. So that becomes the starting point for good news about Jesus. So that's the way in which he specifically identifies Jesus with that. Yes, yes, we're having some <laughs> issues here. Uh, it's almost, whoops, it's almost enough to make me want to to start this recording over. I'm thinking about that. Ah, no, nope. I'm seriously thinking about that right now. Let's see if I can get just what I want out of there. <laughs> no, no, I can't. Well, the uh, text I had there, and let me see if I can fix this. I wish I could stop and pause the recording and, and pull this out, whatever it is here that is doing this. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's just there. We'll, 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 we'll take that. And the passages that I deleted out, let me just add them back in because of this, this glitch we've got. It's going to be verse 26, uh, I believe, and verse 46, where both times Jesus says it is necessary. And there's that idea we said is an, is an emphasis in Luke's gospel, this idea of... Um, not, not fate, but God ordering things where there's this idea of what must come to pass, that God has foreordained this, um, that these things, the, that word day, that these things must, it, it is necessary, that same word is often translated or is translated must. But Jesus said to the disciples on the road to Emmaus that it was, the scriptures tell us, that it was necessary, that the Christ must suffer. And then later he, he repeats that when he is speaking to the disciples before he ascends and how the scriptures speak of how the, the Christ, the Messiah, how the Messiah should suffer. And that is the identification of Jesus as that suffering servant. And then you find that uh, several times throughout Acts, but we're not going to go in and look at those right now. Um, in fact, it'd be great if we could get through this material here, make the class a little bit shorter. Okay, yeah, uh, maybe it'd be easy there. Okay, so now another concept, Jesus, the Messiah, not just the Messiah, the suffering Messiah, the suffering servant talked about in Isaiah. And he's also depicted, and this may be a really a primary way in which Luke presents Jesus to us as the prophet who's like Moses, like Elijah, who's mighty in word and deed. He is a prophet, and in fact, he's not just a prophet. He is the prophet who has come from the Lord. And in Luke's account, this idea, you know, when God would send a prophet to his people, it was thought of as God coming to visit his people with a word from 
the, the prophet was coming with a word from the Lord, and that was a type of visitation from the Lord. And in Luke, Luke 1, 68, that passage we just noted, in the Benedictus, Zechariah talks about God coming to visit. It's finally coming to pass now that God is visiting His people. And so Jesus is the prophet by whom God is visiting His people and by whom God is calling all to repentance. That's the response that needs to be made to the prophet. The prophet has come and brought a word from the Lord, and you see how Luke emphasizes what is the response we need to make. We need to change. That word needs to be received and acted upon. Repentance. And God, through Jesus, the prophet, this prophet is like the prophets of old. He's calling the people to the vision of life that God the vision of life that God intends. And so consider the other themes that we looked at about the proper use of wealth. Jesus stresses these things as how the, uh, the, the change that would be brought about in the social order by means of uh, the influence of the gospel and our response to the gospel. He's calling us to that vision of life that God intends. And he's calling all to inclusion in the people of God. It's not just an individualistic thing where you're called to just accept Christ to be saved and that way your soul is saved and that your salvation is just about you not losing your soul and going to hell and so that you can go to heaven. Your sins will be forgiven and go to heaven. Well, in Luke, it's especially about being called into inclusion in the people of God. And so in that sense, in that sense, let me add, Luke's gospel is the most political of the gospels, certainly more than Matthew and Mark's, in the sense that it's emphasizing the social context, the social reality that comes about when the reign of God is seen in this world. And that's where table fellowship comes in. That's where we see so much emphasis in Luke, where Jesus is having meals with people and Jesus is teaching things about the kingdom of God through parables that are in the context of meals. We looked at all of that. And so it's about, it's about being restored to a right relationship with God as a part of the people of God. And so look, think of those themes that we emphasized along that line. And how that all comes together now. We see that Jesus is presented as that prophet calling us to that vision, calling us to that kingdom, to, those, uh, to be a part of those people, the people of God. Let me get there. Okay. All right. Now, in, the, in Jewish categories, sorry, in Jewish categories, what do we find? A, a prophet. What is expected of a prophet? The prophet is someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's someone who uh, speaks God's word, but not just come, that comes and brings a word from God, but brings a vision of how God's people should live. That when they're under the influence and the reign of the word of God, it creates a certain kind of life and a certain kind of, of world, a just order, where we're all brought in together equally. And we're all striving to share what we have to meet each other's needs. All those things that we looked at under the uh, themes in Luke's gospel. To live in accordance with this call. The, the prophet is expected to live a lifestyle commensurate with what he's calling the people to live. And he's someone who would perform mighty works and uh, mighty deeds among the people. And of course, Luke shows that Jesus fulfills all of those things. And Luke shows Jesus is not just a prophet. He is the prophet. He is the final great prophet to come from the Lord, uh, who's the prophet like Moses and like Elijah. So you see, that singles him out as more than just someone who has the spirit and who speaks the word of the Lord. But prophecy itself is prominent in Luke Acts. So bear, bear in mind that this is a theme we find throughout, and the idea of Jesus as a prophet is 
you see the way that that fits in with, for example, the emphasis of the Holy Spirit, because the prophet speaks by the Holy Spirit. You see in the birth narratives, Mary, Zechariah, even Elizabeth, Simeon and Anna, they all speak. I'm sorry about that. They all speak uh, by the Holy Spirit. And so already we see the emphasis in prophecy. Jesus' cousin John is a great prophet of the Lord who prepares the way for Jesus. And it, the Spirit comes upon Jesus at his baptism, of course, in, uh, in all the synoptics. But then after that in Luke 4, that's when Jesus is in the synagogue in the L passage here, this account that's only in Luke in our programmatic passage, a key text in Luke where he quotes Isaiah and he says the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me. And I failed to point out that's what Messiah means. That's what Christ means, the anointed one, the anointed one. So his spirit is upon me because he anointed me. And then he goes on as he addresses the people to talk about Elijah and Elisha and how he, this is another characteristic of God's prophets, how they're rejected by the people and God's judgment come on the people for rejecting his prophets. And so Jesus brings up the, the, the truism that a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. And then he brings up Elijah, he brings up Elisha and that, that theme of rejection. And then, of course, we see throughout Acts, Jesus promises the Spirit at the end of Luke and at the beginning of Acts. He promises the Spirit and the Spirit comes upon the apostles and they speak by means of the Holy Spirit. And there are others then with the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of prophecy. Well, that all fits in with Christ as the prophet. He's the prophet like Moses. Now, we already pointed out Matthew by the structure of his gospel and by the, by the um, uh, certain literary features of his gospel they, that he presents Jesus as a kind of new Moses, right? Because you have the, uh, the, the, the five major divisions that seem to reflect the five books of the Torah, of the law of Moses, and some other things that we tied in along that line. Uh, but it's only Luke, as we keep saying, it's only Luke who explicitly applies that prophecy where Moses said in Deuteronomy 18.15 that the Lord will raise up a prophet like me, like me, like Moses. That's, a, that's a, uh, in Luke part two now, so we go to Acts, and that passage is e explicitly applied twice to Jesus then think of this, when Jesus appears on the, as we call it, the mountain of transfiguration with Moses and Elijah, it's only in Luke's account of that where we're told, and they spoke of his exodus. It's the Greek word exodus, and it's translated in some versions as his departure, meaning his death and his departure from this world. That may include the idea of his resurrection and ascension. But notice they speak of it in those terms, like Moses and the Exodus. So that's another linkage in unique to Luke's gospel with Moses. But then what about Elijah? Well, the Jews were well aware, Malachi 4 and verse 5, that, that there was predicted a coming of a second Elijah, that God was going to raise up one like Elijah. And so there was this expectation of the coming of Elijah. In the other synoptic gospels, I keep forgetting to get rid of this little glitch here, sorry. Uh, the other synoptics link that prophecy. Interestingly, they link that with John. Ah, but Luke depicts Jesus. Let me show you, though, the way, and it can refer to John, but then also in an ultimate sense to Jesus. And that's what Luke is showing us. Luke has Jesus raising a widow's son. And I have the passages here for you. It'll be in the file, and this is file 27, and I'll hopefully have it up there by the time you see this. But uh, I know I've said that before and then forgot to upload it. I apologize. I need, really need a sip of this Diet Dr. Pepper right here, but then I'm, I'm afraid the carbonation is going to make me well, you know, have trouble speaking through the rest of class. Jesus also ascends into heaven like Elijah did. Um, that's very interesting because only Luke's gospel, if we take the short ending of Mark, only Luke's gospel gives us the ascension. And that's like Elijah as well. And then also uh, Luke 
very, very significantly here. Interestingly, Luke omits the text from Mark that Matthew includes where Jesus says that, uh, well, John is that Elijah who is to come. Uh, Luke leaves that off. And he wants us to think of Jesus. I think that's showing you at least how Jesus is like Elijah. Now, this is where we're going to bring this all together. These titles are all linked together in various passages. I didn't list them here, but for example, Luke 2, 11, you know, the angelic announcement that I keep uh, referring to where the angel tells the shepherds, there is born unto you this day in the city of David a Savior, Christ the Lord. So you'll find a lot of passages where Christ and Son of God uh, various passages where Christ the Son of God is linked, where they're linked together. But all of these major titles that Luke uses portray Jesus as coming in as the anointed one, as the Son of God, as Lord over all, who's the Savior of all men, to bring about God's saving purpose. Now, what I want us to understand is that these different ideas here, um, these different categories, Messiah and the suffering servant, the Son of Man, Luke call, in Luke's Gospel, Jesus does refer to himself as the Son of Man, but I didn't list that separately because it's just as prominent, I believe, in Matthew and in Mark. Uh, so it's not something necessarily it stands out as unique in, in Luke. But when you put all these together, the Son of Man, the Son of God, He's the Mosaic prophet. He's the new Elijah, the second coming of Elijah. When you put all of that together, um, what do you get? Well, in, in the Jewish mind, these didn't go all together. Um, there were various Jewish sects at the time of Christ, and these various Jewish groups had different opinions over who would be how these categories were to be understood. And so they understood them differently. And as far as we, the knowledge that we have of, of the Jewish groups of Jesus' day, that none of them uh, associated these titles and what God would fulfill through these titles in one person. That, uh, as we pointed out, they thought, well, the, a, a one's going to come who is the prophet, and then you have the suffering servant is identified in Scripture, and there are different opinions over what that referred to, and then, of course, the Messiah is going to come. But it's, this is what uh, I want to make sure we understand because it's a very, very powerful and important point, that it was an innovation of the Christian faith to focus these, all these diverse traditions into one person, to say that all these things that the various Jewish groups had differing opinions about as to how they were going to be fulfilled and in what person or persons. It's only in Christ where the claim is made that they all refer to one, and that one is Jesus. So it's an innovation of the Christian faith to put those all in as one person. So Luke, uh, Luke serves as the best example. It's a Christian tradition that identifies them all together, and nowhere more so do we see that than in the writing of Luke, where he brings all these diverse concepts together, and he says they're all fulfilled in Jesus. So in that sense, I'm squeezing this in here at the very, very bottom, but Luke might be thought of as the first systematic theologian, right? We have all this information given to us in the Bible about various subjects and about Jesus and who Jesus is. But Luke, it's like Luke is trying to bring in as many of those concepts as he can and put them all together and say, this is all fulfilled in this man, Jesus the Christ. Beautiful, right? Powerful. I hope that's helpful to you to think of all that Jesus is when we see him through Luke and the way that God wanted him presented to us through the writings of Luke in his gospel and in his history of the early church. So we're going we're gonna to wrap up there, and then what we're going to do next time, Lord willing, Lord willing, is uh, we will look at some of those Greek concepts briefly and then summarize what we've talked about in Luke because it's been a lot of information over a long period of time so that we can set ourselves up to continue. So may... 
the grace of our Lord continue with you and abound in your life is my hope and my prayer. And so now I can finally take a sip. Mm. Mm-hmm.